session before uh, lunch is um, John Finlay from Launchfire, um, who's going to address, uh, again, we're back into this digital adoption and using empathy. So, uh, welcome. Thank you very much. I'll give you the, the magic. Thank you. Hi, folks. So when I um, found out that I had 15 minutes to uh, walk you through using uh, empathy to drive digital adoption, it made me think of uh, a Winston Churchill quote. Ch Churchill was the prime minister of one of the European countries. I can't remember which. Um, but he, uh, he said, uh, it was a bit of a sexist statement, but he said a good speech is like a woman's skirt, long enough to cover the subject, but short enough to create interest. So it was with those tenets in mind uh, that I tried to craft this session. Um, and so um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and the company. Um, we started the company back in 1999. We're a game-based marketing and training company. And our premise was simple. If you want people to do things for you, you've got to focus on what's in it for them. You've got to have empathy. Um, and that's how we started it. Um, about five years ago, uh, one of our banking clients asked us to um, help them use our technologies and our strategies to drive adoption, which we did, and it was really successful. So since then, we've been working in that field. These days, we seem to work best with lean uh, innovation teams who are looking for solutions to help them drive adoption. In the time that we've been working in this space, um, <clears throat> we've learned that a two-pronged approach is really what you need. Of course, you need your customers to be aware of your products, and we need to drive trial and create habits for them to use the products. But you also need to support your frontline staff um, so that um, they can help customers who call in, and they understand the products, and they can support them. Um, because getting people to change their banking habits is difficult. Um, while your fintech is convenient, change isn't. Um, and the aversion to change actually increases with age. I kind of envision that there's a, a change age conversion scale that has a age across the x axis, so as you get older, and then willingness to try new things on the y axis. When you're like two, you're willing to try anything. You're eating rocks, drinking out of the toilet, whatever. But when, by the time you're 40, you're not really willing to try new things. You're set in your ways. And so that's what we're up against as we try to get um, baby boomers and Gen Xers and stuff to change their banking habits. Um, and I think that challenge is a, is a tough one, um, and we need solutions to overcome it. Um, and I think it starts with um, talking to frontline staff. And in talking to frontline staff, we've kind of identified three main obstacles that they've told us um, are obstacles to them helping support the products. The first one is one that our clients don't like to talk about a lot, but it's true and it's real, and people are saying it to us, and that they're worried about job security. They're thinking that if they help evangelize these products and they're successful at getting customers to use them, well, what are they going to be left to do? Are people going to be coming into the branch? And these are legitimate concerns. I mean, who would want to promote a product that's going to work you out of a job? Makes sense. But I think there's a lot of great answers that banks can have for this, like digital did tech-savvy employees are the most important employees that they have and are less likely to be downsized. Banks that are successful at digital, and, at di digital transformation are more likely to be profitable and grow, so that creates jobs. So there's a lot of things, but we've got to find ways to communicate that to, our, to the employees so that they don't have this concern. The second concern is uh, a lack of confidence with digital products. Um, you know, a, a lot of our banks, uh, frontline staff, actually don't bank with them. So they don't use the digital products, they're not familiar with them, and they don't know them cold. And knowing, them, knowing the product cold is actually the gateway to being able to support it and the gateway to being able to promote it. And so um, not having the confidence is, is born out of the fact um, that they're not using the products. And because of that, they're then not willing to recommend the products. I mean, people don't recommend things with which they're not familiar. I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't recommend a lot of things in life, but if I do, it's because it's something that I really like or something that made my life better. My wife wants me to eat more healthily, and she showed me this video of this little thing that you put a piece of zucchini in and turn it, and it makes zucchini pasta, which is apparently much more healthy for you. I didn't buy it based on the video, but my wife was so convinced I would like it, she got it for me for Christmas. So I used it, and I ate this zucchini pasta, and it turns out it tastes exactly like pasta, and I didn't feel all bloated after. So then I made it for friends, and when they come over, I'd show it to them, and look at this thing, it's awesome, because I was passionate about it. And it's that passion that we need to engender 
um, in our frontline staff for them to actually promote the products that you want them to promote. They're not going to do it if they don't understand it. Um, and that passion is, is uh, it takes a, there's a, it's a challenging thing to try to, to try to engender it. So when we explain this to the digital innovation teams, they're like, this makes a lot of sense. We, we're totally bought in, but we don't have the tools to do it. We're stuck with an antiquated learning management system that our employees hate and they don't like to come and engage with. Um, and we don't have modern, pro modern product simulations and things that we can, that we can use to, uh, to drive that product knowledge and familiarity. So um, we've kind of come up with some ways to overcome those obstacles. We've sort of invented a recipe that's been working really well. And so I'll go, I'll go, I'll go through that now. So the first part of the recipe is game-based learning. And game-based learning is, I don't mean gamification. Um, I think gamification is a bit of an overused term these days, and it's uh, also a bit of an underwhelming tactic. The fact of the matter is, uh, gamification is tacking game elements onto existing content. It ignores the fundamental problem. The content sucks. And if the content's crappy, it doesn't matter how many game tactics you tack onto it, the lift you're going to get in engagement is going to be ephemeral, short term and it's not going to last, and it's not going to drive repetitive use, which is what's required to learn. Game-based learning, on the other hand, is morphing your content into a game so that people learn through play, and they learn through repetition, and it's fun for them to do, th do so. It's, it's an empathetic approach, and we found that that's been working really well for us at driving the foundational knowledge. The next one is product simulations, and um, we prefer a challenge-based based approach as opposed to the guided tour. Uh, the problem with the guided tour is we don't really feel like people learn all that well from a guided tour, and whoops, I, I think I went ahead, from the guided tour, um, because um, they're not thinking as they do it. I'll give you an example. You're driving a friend home, they're sitting in the passenger seat, and you, they're giving you directions. And you take, make all the right turns, you get them home, everything's good. You go to drive them home three days later, you don't know how to get there. You don't know how to get there because you turned your brain off because they were telling you what to do. And you'll repeat that numerous times while they're telling you what to do without learning. So instead what we do is we inject challenge. We say, do, um, we issue a challenge in using the simulator. It's not just use it. We don't show you what to do. You have to figure it out and you have to master it. And through issuing a challenge, we get their competitive juices flowing. And when they fail, it's actually good. It's good because they have to do it again. And when they do it again and again and again, that creates um, cold knowledge of that product. And now they're armed with the information they need to be able to be comfortable promoting it. Because if somebody comes into the bank and they want to do whatever type of transaction, if you know the product that is going to solve their problem, make their life easier, and you know it cold, you're going to recommend it. But if you don't, you're just going to revert to your old tactics. You're going to stay on safe ground, because that's, that's how we all operate. So we use this to drive repetitive use and drive intimate product knowledge so they know it cold so they can recommend it. So the last one is role play scenarios. Um, uh, this, and role play scenarios are interesting because they give you an opportunity to inject learning that, you, that, you've, ta that you've acquired um, earlier in a training experience, but they also give opportunity, they also challenge employees to spot opportunities to recommend the digital products. So we try to make our characters lifelike, come into the bank with real challenges that they might face. And the answers, some of the answers, one answer might be perfect, another answer might be kind of right, and the last one, not, is not right at all, just like a real conversation. Sometimes you can take it in the right direction, sometimes you, can, you don't, it's not quite right, but you can find ways to get there. It challenges them to think about when a customer comes in, how am I going to spot that opportunity, and how am I then going to recommend that product? And so this gives them an opportunity to practice in a risk-free environment. So just to recap on the tactics, game-based learning for foundational knowledge, um, challenge-based simulators for repetitive product use, knowing it cold, and simulators to practice in a risk-free environment. And that's been working really well. So we explain this to the innovation teams, and they say, that's awesome, sounds really good. How the heck are we going to get employees to care? How are we going to get them to come and actually engage with this? And we got a solution for that. We wrap it within a game narrative. So this is a game in which your challenge is to grow your bank into the bank of the future. You start with a little wee bank and you're trying to grow it. And you grow it by training. This is only a conduit to drive your employees into the game-based learning modules, the simulators, um, 
and, and the role play scenarios. You'll actually only engage with this, with this um, narrative for like 30 seconds in a, in a day's experience. It's very short. And what you might do is go and buy some upgrades for your bank. And these are, by the way, all your products. And they educate the, the, the employee about why this product helps the bank grow and service customers better and so on and so forth. So you're learning contextually in a fun environment. And you use your currency to buy these. And the currency is interesting because we can also integrate it with your employee rewards program so that points that they earn in the game can actually be redeemed for real world rewards in your program. That's motivation and that's thinking about what's in it for them. That's empathy. And so that's how we, we do that. And of course, this will feature you have the gamification elements, but in the right context, within a game. And so, yes, it's got leaderboards. Um, yes, it's got social, social uh, sharing features and so on and so forth. Um, but it's, it's sort of wrapped within an actual game. And what we found is that people, um, employees are coming back quite regularly to participate. Uh, in fact, in a couple of instances, we've had the problem where employees are spending a little too much time. So we've actually had to put time limits on the amount of time that they can play with the game-based learning modules. Um, the other thing I should mention about this system is you can um, drag in your existing content. If you, if you have existing content, let's say you've got videos or, you, or you've got uh, um, links out to, to uh, your intranet site, other things, you can drag them in as steps in a course. And so you can configure a course that has a product demo, uh, and a game-based learning module, a video, so on and so forth. And through taking all those steps and successfully do, passing the course, the employee earns points, um, which they can then redeem in the, in, the, in the store. So it's a pretty comprehensive package. So that handles the employee side. Um, the other challenge is um, the customer side. And the customer side, I think the same approach applies, and it's been working for us. What we do is we build... Um, uh, incentive-based promotional campaigns for um, our, our bank's customers. So in Canada, a lot of banks are running national, ad ca national TV ads to promote their, their bank tech, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to us because A, they're super expensive, but B, only a very small proportion of the national audience is actually your customer. So a ton of your media dollars are being wasted on people who will never adopt your tech because they're banking with the com competition, and it's really tough to get them to change. So instead, what we do is we focus on their customer base and using their, their media assets that they have to reach them, but we reach them with an empathetic program, a program that offers incentives for them to actually download the app and install it, a program that offers them incentive to use their digital banking tools, to use online banking, and actually incentivizes them to build a habit and, and repeated use and so forth. And it's through that approach um, that you can create the habits that you need to create, and you're always focused on what's in it for them. And I think that's the essence of our message. Um, using empathy is taking the time to think about what's their experience and what will motivate them. And so on the frontline staff, it's giving them the support they need, giving them the knowledge they need to do what you need them to do, which is evangelize the products. But on the customer side, it's giving them a reason to try to experience how convenient these products are and to make them a part of their everyday life. But you do it by thinking about walking in their shoes and thinking about their experience. And, and so that is all I got, folks. Thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions.